Yeah. Yeah. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks very much for coming to our session. I know it's Friday morning. It's eight o'clock. Um, it is uh, a fantastic conference, but it's still an early start. But thanks very much for coming to support <laughs> us. Uh, so our session is on linking research, education, and public engagement in geoscience. In particular, we are really focusing on leadership and strategic partnerships. So my name is Vincent, Vincent Tong, and uh, we have got uh, Rene and Elena uh, chairing our session. Um, unfortunately, um, Brong Yi can't actually make it to the conference, but we have a really wonderful uh, panelist uh, uh, panel here um, with Chris, Lane, Dean, and they will introduce them themselves uh, when they give uh, their uh, presentations, and we also have Carlo, Katie, Pat, will be uh, talking about uh, strategic initiatives. So the, um, that will be the program for our first hour. Um, we're focusing on these two aspects. <coughs> we'll have time for a quick question after each presentation, so um, feel free to ask questions, and um, we'll spend the second hour on the um, taking all the perspectives together and uh, to see whether we can come up with some plans to, uh, to take actions and uh, to, uh, to advance research, education, and <coughs> public engagement uh, synergies. So setting the scene, um, it's our panelists' job. So uh, we don't really have to have more introduction. We'll start with strategic directions. It's somewhat artificial. Obviously, there will be um, also discussions on the initiatives themselves. So we will start by having Chris on board. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Chris McEntee. I'm the CEO and Executive Director of the American Geophysical Union. I hope you've had a really good time in New Orleans. Um, and thank you. If those, would you mind coming forward just a little bit so we're not, <laughs> so we can, can see you? You don't have to come all the way front, but if you would, wouldn't mind coming just a little bit closer, we would appreciate that. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this session, and I'm looking forward to uh, participating on the panel. Uh, so my uh, job this morning is to give you a little bit of an overview of why AGU thinks it's so important to go um, from research to policy to actually engagement of scientists in, in uh, public engagement and societal engagement. Um, it's rooted in AGU's strategic plan. I think you know our mission is science for the benefit of humanity. Um, and when the new strategic plan was adopted in 2010, doesn't seem so new anymore, it was seven and a half years ago, um, they uh, added a goal about science and society into the strategic plan as a second thrust for AGU, um, in addition to the work it had already been doing quite successfully in uh, creating opportunities for science to lead with their, for scientists to lead with their science and share the wonderful work through meetings and our publications and other kinds of events. Uh, now we're living in what Oxford Dictionary in 2016 labeled actually the year, the word of the year was a post-truth world. And, the, their definition of that is that we're in an era where people's values and emotions tend to uh, um, contribute to a much greater extent to what they view as common evidence and facts than actually scientific facts and other kinds of factual evidence. Um, and although I live and work in the United States and it seems very apparent here, uh, and our current uh, president, who seems to ignore facts on almost a daily basis, um, and the whole movement of populism and nationalism, this is not a unique U.S. phenomenon. I have an opportunity to travel all over the world on behalf of AGU, and I hear it when I'm in Europe, I hear it when I'm in uh, uh, South America, uh, not so much in the Asian countries, but it still exists in pockets all around the world, and it has to do with growing nationalism, growing populism, and an increasing um, divide between the rich and poor, and a feeling that the establishments of the past, including intellectuals, um, universities, and others, although they have contributed greatly to society, 
are somehow leaving behind a lot of people around the world, and it's causing dramatic changes in our, in our, in our world outlook. Um, that is probably pretty similar to things that happened at the beginning of the 20th century. It's just that none of us were around at that time. Uh, so we are in a very unique time for scientists to actually increase their engagement and find effective ways to be able to have facts and evidence be one of the main um, contributors to uh, deciding future policy um, in countries around the world and globally. Uh, from AGU's view, I think you're all familiar with Pasteur's Quadrant. Um, certainly there's a lot there in terms of pure basic research, use inspire research, purely applied research, and from AGU's perspective, we're going from purely in our science and policy engagement work from purely applied research actually into what I would call community science partnerships. Um, and our first experience in this is something we started three years ago called our Thriving Earth Exchange, where we partner with organizations that have members which are representing city leaders. Um, and based on their real world problems that they're dealing with day to day, like in the city of New Orleans here with subsidence, um, we uh, identify with them what are the challenges where an earth or space scientist could assist them. Uh, we now, and then we match them. Um, so we now have 65 projects. They span areas from natural and man-made disaster resilience to climate change resilience to natural resource limitations. Um, and at this point in time, those 65 projects are benefiting 10 million people. Um, and this is a program we plan to continue to expand um, into the future through a lot of collaboration and partnership. Um, and we're finding out a lot about what community leaders are looking for and what makes a community ready to actually engage in such a problem-solving exercise with scientists and also what kind of skill sets that scientists need to develop to effectively partner uh, with community leaders. Um, in addition, AGU increasingly over the last five or six years has been really uh, amplifying its voice in public policy. Um, and it's our view that scientific societies have a very important role to play in scientific policy through three avenues. One is societies can express the collective voice of their members uh, through position statements, through uh, societal relationships with policymakers, and through working in coalitions with a lot of organizations, some of which are here today, that we work very actively with in coalitions. Secondly, we can do a lot to educate and train scientists to be effective in societal interactions and policy interactions through workshops, tools and resources, and even fellowships like congressional science fellowships or mass media fellowships. Um, there we had a whole host of those kinds of programs and workshops here today, uh, here this week in New Orleans, and we have a wonderful Science is Essential page up on our website that has, shows you all the compendium of resources that are available to assist you. Uh, increasingly, we're looking at how do we give better rewards and recognition and visibility to scientists who engage in this kind of work. Our first foray into this was our ambassador awards. However, we are very well aware that without giving rewards and recognition, we won't be able to fully have a cultural change in science that actually societal engagement is very important and should be valued by the academic setting. Uh, so I want to thank you very much for being here and for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, kind of set a strategic direction and why AGU feels this is important. Um, and I hope also that you will feel free to participate in our programs and also uh, participate over the next few years in leading up to our centennial in 2019. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions from the audience? Yes. Oh, okay. So, um, how has the um, attitude of the scientists, how, how have they accepted this, you know, effort about bringing uh, science to, to the people? Mm -hmm. uh. I would say that um, not everyone, it's not for every scientist, but we're seeing an increasing demand uh, for scientists who want to be activate. Um, in our sharing science network, we've probably almost doubled the number of participants in one year. 
um, here. Um, we're seeing our workshop uh, demands for workshops increasing. We held about 12 workshops in different research institutions this year. Uh, so we're seeing increased um, activity and interest, particularly around um, among younger scientists um, who are looking for career paths um, that build upon the academic career path but want to be able to do something that they feel is contributing in a greater extent to society or in an additive uh, way for society. Okay. So. Um, I'm up next. Um, my name is Lynn Chambers, and I am um, at NASA. I'm a scientist there. And I'm going to take a really big step back from the sort of large scale view that Chris gave with the society and talk more about a, a personal or individual um, experience with this topic. So, um, well, we'll start with the big picture. You know, when you think about NASA, a lot of people think about either astronauts or they think about planets in outer space. And so, for example, we have uh, the Kepler spacecraft, which made news even just yesterday, looking at planets. So, you know, looking with a very nice um, device out into space is, is one way to understand a planet. But NASA also um, is working on understanding our planet. And if you've been in any of the sessions um, on NASA Earth Science, you've seen a, a diagram like this where, you know, we have something like 16 to 20 um, satellites at any one time that are looking at the Earth plus a lot of other um, instrumentation and another 20 or so that are in work. So a lot, lot more focus on that. Um, so it's, it's a very um, multi-faceted and it engages a lot of people. Uh, but then if you really focus in on how do we understand our planet, you know, as human beings, um, we have to do it in a much more directed way. So these are just a few uh, pictures from some of my colleagues who work in the field, um, you know, launching radio sound balloons, um, uh, flying aircraft through uh, various parts of the atmosphere to look at various things, um, even uh, research vessels where they're doing air-sea interactions and, and, and things like that. And then the personal on the lower left, um, you know, direct experience, direct observation. Um, so to really understand our planet that we live on, we need all of these aspects. And we need more than, even though there are 20,000 plus members of AGU, that's not enough to really understand our planet because it is such a large place. So my experience, um, I'm actually a, an aerospace engineer by training. Um, I've started working, oh gosh, more than 20 years in, ago now um, in atmospheric science and specifically in energy budget. And um, I was really surprised because when I started working in this field, I had never heard of the term ed energy budget before. <laughs> and it seems like it's a pretty fundamental thing that you ought to know about the Earth. Um, and so that experience really led me to start looking into um, education and public engagement because, you know, if we live on this planet and somebody as educated as I was didn't even know that there was such a thing as the energy budget, that tells you that there's a fair uh, gap in knowledge and understanding. Um, so this is our classic energy budget picture. And um, in particular, the most important factor in the energy budget is clouds. And so clouds, um, are one of those things that people people love. You know, kindergartners, even before kindergarten, people around the world, there's actually a cloud appreciation society, uh, which that may be the only essential climate variable in the planet that has an appreciation society. So it's a great um, point of engagement. And so we actually developed a program to get students to do cloud observations that are coordinated with our satellite. and it. Um, has been quite successful. We've got thousands of people in 100 plus countries around the world. I just picked up a few pictures here um, that are actually doing cloud observations and reporting them back to NASA for validation and then getting the, the NASA satellite data back uh, to compare to what they saw. And so you can see you know, very young kids. You can see um, people in the US as well as people in what would be more developing countries where they have many fewer resources, but you don't need instruments to look at clouds. And so we can really engage both kids and adults uh, with this topic. And then 
bring them into a little bit of understanding of, hey, there is such a thing as the energy budget, and it really does matter. So, you know, why I kind of give you a little bit why I'm passionate about this already, but here's sort of my trajectory. As I was preparing for this session, I started really thinking back about my education. Um, you know, in elementary school, I didn't learn really anything about the earth, except um, we spent a lot of time climbing mountains, riding bicycles through mountains, uh, skiing down mountains, um, as well as other natural uh, features. So I really got a good grounding as a child um, in the Earth system and, and, you know, some of the big, big things that happened. Uh, middle school, the only class I could think of was a geography class that I had to take, and really that was mostly uh, political geography, so a lot of the things that I learned in middle school are no longer relevant, you know. Capitals of countries in Europe have changed quite a bit um, since then. Um, in high school, in undergrad and grad school, I had no exposure at all to geoscience. Now, I am an aerospace engineer by training, so that might not be too surprising, but it's a little bit surprising that I would not have any exposure at all. And then even in my career, once I started working at NASA, for about the first 10 years, I was working on things like the space shuttle, uh, Mars missions. Again, with the exception of kind of looking at, you know, getting back through the atmosphere, that was about it. Um, so really, uh, a very long time in my life with, without geoscience. And yet, you know, life on our planet really depends on that and understanding what the features are is, is, is really important. So um, in, in just closing, I wanted to really bring in the concept of, of um, you know, the, the title of this session is linking um, research, education, and public engagement. And I just pulled out one quote uh, from Google, thank you Google, um, from a Nobel laureate who talks about um, interdisciplinarity and the fact that, you know, really uh, when you get to creative ideas, the only way to do it, and I, there was a session about this yesterday, um, is really to struggle and to learn something that's outside of your comfort zone and, and to learn about different ways of looking at things. And so I think that this is really an um, impactful way that we can understand our planet. Thank you. Is there a question from the audience? I have a question. Okay. So in 2013, with the Next Generation Science Standards, there's a focus. Uh, I'm using my teacher voice, so I thought everyone could hear me. Okay. Um, in 2013, in the United States, we have the Next Generation Science Standards, which focuses more on performance expectations and students being able to do science as well as the scientific and engineering practices. Have you seen a change in citizen science or student engagement from 2013? or do you project there will be going forward? Yeah, um, I, I think that there will be. I don't think that I've personally seen it yet. I think a lot of teachers, I mean, you know, NGSS has not been adopted uniformly yet, and a lot of teachers are really still struggling and trying to find the right, you know, the right curriculum, the right materials to help them. And I think uh, AGU is very poised to help with that, as well as the GLOBE program, which I now um, oversee is, is very well poised to do that, but it's taking us a while to really figure out what are the resources and tools that the teachers need to really uh, enable them to grab onto that. I think there's some people that are, um, you know, there's always people that, that do that earlier than others, but in terms of the mass of people, I think we still got a little bit of work to do. So good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Dean Musavi. I am the Education Programs Coordinator for the Geological Society of America in Boulder. And GSA, like AGU, has uh, its hands in many different activities designed not just to advance science and to enable exchange of information between scientists, but also really to get to the point of why we fund science at all. Uh, Science is interesting, it's a great way to make a career, but ultimately science, <coughs> society 
is supportive of science because science helps to solve practical problems. It helps us to answer lifelong questions that have faced humanity for centuries. And that is, in a sense, where community engagement and outreach really, uh, really make their mark because scientists could discover all solutions to all the world's problems, but if they're never communicated in a way that the public can use, then society does not gain the benefit of that knowledge. So in, in preparing for today's uh, panel, I didn't, decided I didn't want to go through and put up a bunch of uh, policy positions from GSA, because all our societies have these, and these are derived ultimately from the membership. What I wanted to try to explain is the unique role that societies like GSA, like AGU and our peers play in the interface between science and society. So what I've tried to do in a rather complex diagram is to paint how, an ac how the academic science generally works. So you have here uh, universities in the, so near the center here that are receive the research funding from the various science agencies like NOAA, NASA, and NSF. Uh, the, oh, yeah, thank you. So you can see up in here. And you have researchers within these institutions that are funded through their universities. But the reality is in most academic institutions, the faculty that have tenure and have, have access to the grant system is a relatively small subset of all the people who do the teaching. So this, this red circle here is the, the Venn diagram for the research world. Most of the teaching is down here with contingent faculty and graduate students who are not as well connected to research. And these are the people that have a lot of the connections to the next generation of citizens and all those citizens who don't go to university. So in this system, unfortunately, knowledge is generated up here and then is communicated through very top-down, elite-type approaches. So voices from the universities, voices that go through the political parties, and there is, shall we say, some clouds for, for Lynn, barriers to the people down here. And you see this with questions like climate change. You know, we may say that 97% of scientists are in concurrence about this, but the citizens down here are saying, well, my beer's frozen here at this festival. That means more to me than all these papers. So we have a disconnect between where the public is and where science is. And this leads to policy being made here, which seems to ignore science. Societies, however, are in a different position. They are a much more egalitarian system. It doesn't matter whether you are a, you know, a research fellow at a R1 university or a contingent faculty member at a community college or a public school teacher. Everyone is able to participate in the society and the ideas get shared back and forth. The Venn diagrams are thus much bigger and the messages of science go out in many different ways to audiences that have credibility with the public. So teachers can work with contingent faculty, with tenure track faculty, with researchers in a, in a more um, egalitarian way, and then the message that get, messages that get to society come from all of these different voices. And this helps to give the public a better understanding of the information they need to, to hear. You know, being, with this meeting being in New Orleans, we see a good example of the importance of this. Back in 2002, three years before Hurricane Katrina, the Times-Picayune did a series of articles talking about what would happen to this area if a Category 3 storm hit. The science was very sound. The predictions of what areas would flood were right on target, but people didn't act. Politicians didn't act, the public didn't act, and we saw the results. This is why we need more outreach, more convincing of the public through all these other media of teachers, faculty at different institutions, different levels, through our societies, to, so that 
the people can see the forest for the trees. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Do we have a question from the audience? I have a question. Yes. So you mentioned um, the, ev the facts and information that was available um, if, ac if better action would have occurred at, uh, when Katrina was coming. Can you talk a little bit about how you see bridging the gap with social scientists? I was told this wonderful story by a person on the city council in Broward County, Florida. Um, when they were asking people to evacuate for a hurricane, they couldn't understand why people wouldn't evacuate. It was because the shelters wouldn't take a dog and people didn't want to leave their pets. And now that they know that, the shelters accept pets, or they have some shelters that accept pets, and then they've seen an increase in individuals being willing to get out of trailers and in harm's way uh, from severe weather events. So can you talk a little bit about kind of bridging those gaps across other sciences in addition to earth and space science? Thank you, Chris. That's actually a very good example. And in, in fact, for those, if you have time while you're still here in New Orleans, if you go to the State Museum next to the cathedral, they have a big exhibit on Katrina that talks exactly about that problem and how one of the lessons that came from Katrina was you need policies that account for pets in much the way you would, you know, a child. Fam the families value these animals and they will make decisions based on that. So now the law actually requires that all the local relief agencies have mechanisms to handle at least you know, reasonable pets like cats and dogs and such. So the social scientists like natural scientists very easily can get siloed. So it's that forest and the trees issue. You're so busy looking at what's infecting a certain type of bark on a certain type of tree that you lose sight of the forest, which is what most people really care about. So how do you build these bridges with the social sciences? You, partly, you need to interact with them in these informal venues. So we need the social sciences scientists to come to our meetings. We need to take them out into the field, show them what do we do, and listen to what they say, because they're going to see this, this science from a very different perspective. They're not going to be worried so much about how a particular sensor measures you know, PAR. They're going to be interested in how does this information affect the decisions that a farmer is going to make or that a family is going to make in deciding what type of roof to put on their house. We also need to go to their conferences and listen to their work and their um, challenges because we actually will have insights into some of their challenges. Uh, earlier this week, I went with we're privileged enough to go on a tour of some of the levee breaches with the state climatologist. It was a group of seven people. We had three scientists, two social scientists, and a person from the media, and a former state park manager. The quality of these discussions was amazing because it wasn't just experts on levee construction talking about this or that facet. It was the bigger picture. Why did these neighborhoods flood? Why were people not prepared? What do you do if you're in a house and the water is suddenly rising and you end up in your attic and it didn't occur to you to bring an ax with you should you need to chop your way out? Social scientists study these issues. They have these stories as part of their work. We need to hear these stories and contribute to theirs. So I don't know if that answers the question. But. Well, thanks very much, Chris, Lynn, and Dean, for your insightful presentations, uh, setting the scene for us. Um, we'll have the second part of the, the first section. Um, it will be on the strategic initiatives. So uh, we'll have Carlo uh, representing the European Geosciences Union and also uh, Ecole Normale Superior in France. So, Carlo. So how are you? Do I... Okay, good morning. As uh, I'm from Europe, I, the first slide is a presentation of what I do and what I, depend, depending on my activity, I'm based in the Ecole Normale in Paris for my scientific activity, and I am chair of a committee on education 
of the European Geoscience Union. And uh, the four slides represent my activity, the first one, and giving the Holmes Lecture in uh, Vienna. In the, the other two lower most are my activity field in the field. I am a paleomagnetist and drilling rocks like that. And I, most of all, I like nature and dogs and uh, all kind of animal. These are two dogs met by chance in Greece. So, uh, so the Committee on Education was fu uh, funded about 15 years ago by myself and a group of uh, dedicated scientists with uh, in, as a first task to address secondary school teachers. And we, our main activity is to organize the gift workshop. The name is the same as for HU because the first of this gift workshop organizing Nice was actually a common one between AGU and EGU. We have about 80, 85, maybe 90 teachers every year, and uh, we have a general theme for each of these gift workshops. <coughs> the general theme is chosen so that we can represent progressively all the divisions of EGU, but also if there is a special special scientific year, like the polar year a few years ago, we organized a gift workshop on that particular theme. Because we think that the kids will ask their teachers more about the polar, why the polar region at that particular year. And so we change uh, in uh, every year and uh, we believe that having a single theme is more adept to European schools than having many lectures on different, on different subjects. Remember that uh, we face a problem which uh, we are, uh, in Europe you drive 500 miles and you can cross two or three nations. Each one of these nations has a different or slightly different educational system. So we have to address all of them. And also we have to address different languages. So the only solution is that uh, we use English all over. The, for the gift workshop, for European teachers, we fund everything, the travel and the stay in, uh, in Vienna. We actually rent a, a almost an entire hotel, so we have good prices for that. And since 2009, we decided to move uh, the gift workshop, not only in Vienna during the, uh, the same thing as the meeting here for, for European, and uh, we have moved to different nations like Mexico, Malaysia, Peru, Ethiopia, South Africa, three times in South Africa, and so on. We are also organizing during the uh, General Assembly of EGU a poster session in which the, the teachers can show their posters mixed up with scientists present at the EGU. We have a gift distinguished lecture series, which means that if a group of European uh, teachers of, let's say, 50 or 60 get together, they can ask one lecture from EGU, and we uh, pay for the trip and for the stay. We have a program of Teacher at Sea, where uh, everybody is accepted, uh, in incidentally, and uh, not only European people. I, I should have said before that uh, for the gift workshop, we found at least the stay in Vienna for everyone worldwide. This year we have seven American teachers coming. And finally, we found uh, different things. <coughs> so for instance here, 
I show the uh, gift workshop in Merida, in Mexico, which is the Minister of Education himself. This one is uh, in Malaysia. This one is uh, Francois Tilkin ma making a demonstration of what we call a sismo box in Istanbul. And finally, this is a gift workshop in South, in South Africa. Very colorful. I show this picture here because uh, this is the mayor of Cusco in Peru, and he is giving me a diploma which is called the Visitante Distinguido. It's just below the honorary citizenship. If I show this, <coughs> it's to show that this gift workshop was very important for the town of Cusco. And this is why we do it in many developing countries. And we also have other programs like the Corinthos Reef Lab in collaboration with other associations. And we mix up a, a research science and a PhD from Greece, a, a, a PhD student from France, and a teacher from Greece. And also we do in, in Italy, in, in Sicily precisely, for the uh, for the study of the Etna program. Oops, sorry, that was my, <laughs> my, last, <laughs> my last slide. So we welcome every suggestion, incidentally, and we want to develop even more of the program of gift workshop in developing countries. And I hope we did that, Chris. Initially, we had a collaboration with the American Geophysical Union I don't know why it went down. I hope we can start that again, because education is above anything else, in my opinion. In the gift workshop, we have always invited people from industry, from, from NASA, from ESA, from, from the, even people who, who main interest is financial one for the future, and so on. So we try to give the teachers in high school and elementary school some tools for uh, explaining to their kids what science means. So that even if they become lawyers or doctors or anything else, they have something in their mind that uh, will allow decision-making people to take science into their uh, way of judging things. Thank you. I'm curious if you try and link the teachers so that they stay connected after the participation and gift so they can build this large network that shares resources? Yeah. Uh, I was, uh, I'll tell you a story. I, 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 one of the French teachers just went to, for Erasmus, you know, this uh, European program among high school, and she went to Turkey. And so. Uh, I told her, there is a Turkish, a Turkish guy, do you, do you want his address? And she said, well, of course I know him. <laughs> we have corresponding after, uh, corresponding via email and via any kind of thing after the gift workshop. Uh, I still get emails and, uh, from teachers worldwide uh, Nine years ago, they attended the gift workshop, but still now they ask me, you know, what to do in this case, uh, what thing. So there is a huge, a huge uh, network going on. I believe there are 2,000 teachers corresponding in this network. And maybe we have touched even more, uh, even more uh, students, not only teachers. One thing which we have, which is called Planet Press, and I did not have time to, is that EGU, like EGU, publish some on a, a very important scientific thing, uh, in, in, you know, in, in our web page, um, we publish a report on that. And then we have a Planet Press, which is the same report, adapt 
for kids. And because you cannot expect a Croatian kid to understand English, we have translated in maybe <coughs> it's an average 20 different uh, languages. And we have had, uh, had asked a teacher to do a translation. A Croatian teacher will translate into Croatian and so on. For the kid, for the, the, his parents, his or her parents, and for the schools. So we try to keep on this going. I am particularly interested in, in this kind of thing because I am a grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I like kids and uh, I also think that uh, in this particular moment of political uh, you know, stuff all over the world, what we can do for the kids is, uh, is very important. Myself, I have been an exchange student when I was 15, year, 15 years old, American Field Service exchange student, and in Winnetka, Illinois, in a very beautiful school, New Trier High School. And if I have so such a pleasure to come to the States, I think it is because I remember. I've been formed in that school. Hey, my name is Katie Spellman. I bring an early career perspective to this panel, and I'm gonna talk about how I've kind of, in my career path, converged on citizen science as a um, strategic initiative to do science, engage people in science, and um, provide opportunities for education. Um, how many of you guys have attended um, some of the education sessions? Yeah, okay, this is our crowd, guys. <laughs> All right. um, some of the words, you know, if we made a word cloud of words that kept bubbling out of those sessions, um, trusted messengers would be one of the words that was big on that word cloud. Um, bridge builders and translators. And um, so I just wanted us to think a little bit about how do we build the capacity of those individuals who can be translators. Dean, I liked your double bubble. So in early primary language, you would call it a double bubble diagram, right? And in, in science language, we call it a vendor diagram. Um, I, I said that because I'm demonstrating that there are people that speak both of those languages and they lived between those two bubbles. There are two orange dots. I'm one of those orange dots on your diagram. And um, there, I, I wanted to highlight some of the moments in um, my early career path that have been influential in developing my capacity as one of those um, bridge builders and translators. So here's my, my timeline. It starts back in the 1980s. <laughs> um, and really, the first key milestone is affirming my identity as a scientist and an educator. That's my dad. He still wears that same shirt. Um, <laughs> he's a, and, and that's our home in Alaska. And, Really, um, as a, a young person, getting out in the field and actually doing science and having mentors, when I was in kindergarten, Dr. Elena Sparrow, she handed me a big purple ribbon for my science fair project, How Do Colors Blend? And she told me I could be a woman scientist someday. And, I, and my mom said, Katie, you could be a scientist. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Um, and both of my parents were educators, and so they were talking pedagogical language all the time in our house. But to have also influences as a young person of scientists who could actually get you practicing science as a little kid was, was critical. Um, I ran too many Xerox machines as a little kid in my parents' classrooms. And then really um, the next step was building interdisciplinary skills. I loved the quote that Lynn had about interdisciplinarity because really, as an early career person who, um, who, who said, oh, Chris, you said that young scientists are, were craving to be in the mix, to have our science be meaningful for society, to 
save the world, Chris. Mm -hmm. And really, um, it, it is uh, this interdisciplinary pathway is more and more popular at our institution and institutions across the country. Um, and two experiences that were funded by the National Science Foundation for me were critical in training me to build capacity as a translator between education and outreach and scientific research fields. Um, and the GK12 program where you get actual field practice in education while doing your rigorous um, science degree. Uh, and then the IGRT program, which was the Interdisciplinary Graduate Education Research Traineeship. Is there anybody from the NSA? Yeah. And, and in that, we actually are brought together in a, in a model similar to what Dean was saying. Um, you're uh, with social scientists and training with them as a cohort and speaking each other's language. That, and it decreases some, some of that um, hesitation barrier to just show up at a social science meeting because you're already friends with some social scientists in your grad cohort. So that, that was a critical experience for me to, be, to feel comfortable and to have the vocabulary for building the bridges across different bodies of theory and different research methods. Um, and then um, cultivating leadership. Uh, early in my career, a few of my mentors, you know, I was applying for jobs in the real world, and a few of my mentors said, yeah, you could be the education director of a nonprofit if you want to, and Elena Sparrow being one of the mentors that told me that. And, uh, and, then, and then getting the opportunity to lead very large projects in our, in our state. Um, as a young scientist, that was really critical also in building my confidence and my identity as an interdisciplinary translator. And, and then finally, um, settling on braiding this actual scientific research in my own career with education and outreach um, through citizen science. And our strategic initiative, um, I guess that's being highlighted, Vincent, is, is our approach to citizen science. And um, as a team, we really, um, we offer a spectrum of levels of citizen science engagement from researcher driven to community driven approaches and, um, and really try to think about how to engage people where they're at and what they value um, through citizen science, focusing on things like um, resources important to different communities in Alaska and, um, and doing it in ways that are culturally responsive. Um, I'll skip through, through, this is just, yeah, lots of, we offer lots of different programs. And thanks to NASA funding, we have a new, uh, new one-year-old project called Arctic and Earth Science um, that really tries to blend different models of citizen science and use um, the indigenous knowledge and local knowledge as a foundation for um, the citizen science process. Um, yeah, so, mm -hmm. thank you. Questions from the panel? Well, I have a question. <laughs> yeah. So at what point did you decide you wanted to be a scientist since you had all of these interdisciplinary experiences and your parents are educators? Yeah. At what point did science seem real for you? I think um, I was choosing a major in undergrad and uh, you know, you're, soft, you're at the end, you're in your sophomore year, and you're like, what do I choose? And I, was, I called my dad, and he's an English teacher, and I was like, Dad, I love philosophy and English, and I love uh, biology and geology, and he was like, Katie, stick with the sciences, because if you, you can always come back to English, it's an easier vocabulary for you to learn. <laughs> <laughs> and if you miss out on those classes in the sciences, you won't ever be able to speak that language. And so that's, that was my, and then I was like, okay, and then I'll just go get a PhD in ecology too. And, <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. So, and that was from an English teacher. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Pat Harcourt, and I'm the project manager for Made Clear. Uh, which, because it's a, a, a National Science Foundation funded uh, organization, has an acronym, uh, which means the Maryland and Delaware Climate Change Education Assessment and Research. And I, like 
the panelists and probably many of you work at the intersection of science and education. So uh, this is a, just a little case study of one way that we try to translate and bring science, the process of science, the practice of science to a variety of audiences. And I'm gonna ask the group uh, today, because we're a climate change education project, where did you first hear about climate change? What was your, when do you remember first hearing about climate change? Anybody? Hmm. From the internet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's right. What other sources? <laughs> uh, so climate change education is a relatively new phenomenon. And uh, because of that, teachers uh, in the public schools are, are ill-equipped to, uh, to provide research-based climate change information to their students. So in our project, we aimed to, uh, to both fill that gap with climate change science information, but also approach it in a way that uh, would promote general science literacy and helps not just students, but public audiences understand the process of science, how it works. And I think I have, right. So these are our goals. And um, in general, we have our formal education audiences. And we were very comfortable with those because everything is already set up. And we already have good communication and great buy-in from public education audiences. Uh, and higher education, especially, uh, is very close to the research world. But the, our purview also includes uh, reaching public audiences and also some policy makers and decision makers. So that made us have to stop, reassess, and think about new and creative ways to, to come together with those groups. And as you know, climate change is a different kettle of fish. It's, uh, it's not like the hydrologic cycle. When you start uh, even mentioning the, the phrase climate change, some people start to um, react in a way because of a tremendous amount of misinformation. But there have been some really interesting surveys. This one um, is by How et al. And it's on the uh, Yale Climate Change Communication Project. The, uh, the map on top, the dark colors uh, show above 50% and the lighter, bluer colors show below 50%. The top map shows uh, the percentage of adults who think global warming is happening. This was in 2016. The bottom map shows the percentage of adults who think global warming is, or the, the rate of global warming is related to human impacts or to human influences. So uh, there's a real dichotomy there and work by Dan Cahan at Yale and others have shown that there's a close correlation with political affiliation. So that the data, the information, that's not the only input that's influencing people's attitudes. So as a climate change educator, we have to understand that. And we can't just assume that people are going to treat uh, the topic of climate change like learning about the hydrologic cycle. So um, in reaching uh, broader audiences that we need to consider that. Uh, so we, of course, uh, had programs that were set up with some of our original partners, the University Systems of Maryland and Delaware, including public uh, and private colleges. Uh, we had the state departments of education in both Maryland and Delaware, uh, strong support from them. Um, and then we, we started uh, reaching out uh, with uh, the network of informal science educators. And for them, one of the problems was the source of information. Where were they getting their, their science information? Was it from the internet? Well, we wanted to make sure that they were getting research-based information. So we uh, helped to uh, form a community of practice where um, they were informed by uh, professional scientists and, uh, and shared both their needs and their ideas for reaching out. They teach everybody. Uh, most of the science education that happens after uh, formal schooling happens in informal science education centers. Everybody goes there. So uh, these are a really important part of the team. Then we had to move on to audiences with uh, whom we were less familiar. So scientists, especially grad students, were wonderfully uh, willing to come out and talk to and meet with uh, members of new audiences. Um, state and local government leaders, we worked with the State Climate Change Commission to reach them. Business owners, we, uh, we partnered with a, a state program to award 
uh, recognition to businesses who used uh, green practices, and then faith communities. And we talked about the uh, trusted messenger. There, um, there's a terrific uh, climate scientist down at Texas Tech, Catherine Hayhoe, who uh, is also um, an evangelistic Christ Christian. And so she's a trusted messenger for faith communities to say, here's the research on climate change, and it's, and it's solid, and it's, it's valuable. Um, planners and then health professionals who can communicate to very broad audiences about the impacts of climate change and appropriate behaviors for their patients to take. So we came up with some uh, guidelines and a lot of these are uh, based on the collective <coughs> impact work that was done by um, John Cania and Mark Kramer. Um, so understand the partner's interest and we, if you want to move forward, you need to make sure that everyone's benefiting and that some of those goals are shared. And looking beyond the usual suspects, we had uh, agriculture educators and workforce educators who, um, who were new to the, the world of climate change science and climate education, but they understand that the impacts do affect them, so we were able to collaborate with them. Um, regular communication, don't, leave, don't love them, leave them, like I think Katie just uh, said. And um, the rate of change is incremental. It's moving the mountain. Uh, but the mountain must be moved. We must move it. It's just a slow change. Um, and remaining flexible and open to new ideas, we, uh, it's so much more comfortable to stay within our, uh, our very rich environment of academia. But everybody needs to know about the process of science, that opinions aren't the same thing as a, as a science report. Uh, and that um, science is really exciting and, uh, and worth becoming involved in. So thanks very much for that. Do we have a question from the audience? There is. Yeah. So it's often struck me that our students are really ahead of our teachers because they grew up with climate change and they grew up with that in their vocabulary and the changes that are going on. And I've um, thought about whether this is a bit of a barrier for teachers. Would you have any thoughts on that? That's a great question. And uh, teachers are um, extremely motivated to learn more about climate change because their students are demanding it. They're demanding information and they're demanding uh, opportunities to address climate change. So um, there's a tremendous gap in, in the um, professional preparation of teachers right now. So we're working to address that with professional development for in-service teachers and also we're working closely with uh, pre-service teacher instructors in higher education. But the students are driving it. And uh, one other point is that students in higher education are demanding sustainability and climate change education uh, yeah. because they want to live it, not just learn about it. Cool. Great question. Well, thanks very much, Carlo, Katie, and Pat uh, for your really wonderful presentations and actually telling us so much information and how you, how you manage to do these wonderful innovative uh, projects. Uh, and I think there is a message probably emerging uh, from all these presentations. Um, leadership takes place everywhere. It's a collective effort. It is something that, um, that everybody can do in their roles. Uh, different stages of their careers, and I think it is a very uh, exciting um, uh, set of, uh, uh, of, well, we have uh, got a really um, exciting context uh, for the second part of the, um, of the session. So we will spend the next hour, or nearly an hour, on uh, discussing um, what we can do about taking forward um, research, education, public engagement synergies. Um, well, there are two overarching questions uh, just to um, give the uh, discussion a little bit of a focus. Um, it's all about partnership. So um, I think we can explore more based on what we have got here, a vast range of experience, how we can um, engage with institutions, academics. When I say academics, I take, I use, well, I mean, it, uh, take the, uh, the, uh, the, the broadest uh, 
uh, understanding of the term, so it can be academics, it can be outreach uh, educators, it can be teachers, so academics in that sense. So academics and institutions uh, working together to advance the synergies and how we can actually work with students and other uh, partners, external stakeholders to, uh, to advance the synergies. So these are two um, overarching questions. Um, just thought that um, it might be helpful to um, just to, to structure the session a little bit. So these are the four topics that uh, uh, we have identified. Um, so it would be really great to have uh, the panelists' thoughts on the uh, on these areas. So um, we'll have time for about maybe pr probably about ten minutes on each topic. Uh, but it depends on how the discussion uh, goes. So we can uh, have. Uh, um, well, a little bit of flexibility. Um, so we start with frontier research outputs and uh, processes. So there are lots of uh, uh, discussions about using uh, research materials and engaging research scientists in education. Um, I'm just using some um, of my experience and maybe just to, well, this is not uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, I mean, Obviously, there are many more examples, but uh, just to highlight a few things that may, may help with the discussion. Um, so we talk about accepted knowledge and things that are, well, can be presented in uh, textbooks, if, if you like, but uh, there are emerging, um, uh, there is an emerging body of knowledge with state-of-the-art discoveries. How can we actually communicate that to the general public? And how do we deal with uncertainties and, uh, and and the uh, well, it's not a, an easy concept for for anybody uh, to, uh, to 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 grasp. And uh, how do we do that uh, with the public? And uh, what is the role of the uh, research scientists in this endeavor? And we talk about a lot of uh, uh, well, most of the time the sort of research outputs. So the information, the knowledge that we get from uh, from research. But how about the research processes? Um, the hard work that goes into the um, into making knowledge, and how about the culture of research? How research is actually done, and um, and the societal uh, impacts on how um, research culture is understood. So, um, well, I just hand over to the um, to the panel, and um, would any of you uh, want to start? Maybe just. Uh, to uh, uh, have, have your thoughts on these issues? Uh, Vincent, uh, I think into the first step in answering your question is to remember who in many ways must, must drive the discussion. If you look at many, um, many programs in the United States, research programs require a certain percentage of the funding be spent on education and outreach programs. And this was designed to ensure that the public was getting value for their, for their dollar. A problem with many of these programs, however, is that the, the research is very, very specific. It requires a lot of background understanding. And the, the PIs, you know, they need to share this, they want to share this with the public. So they often will they'll find a teacher, they'll find a school, and they want to do a, a huge program on their, on their t information. But it, they have never asked, what does the teacher need? Given where the students are at, how, how does, does my research program have to fit into the existing curriculum and where the students are? And so what often happens is you get research scientists you know, in, with all the best of intentions sharing information that completely goes over the heads of the students and is not tied into what the, to what the teacher actually is, is required to do. And they face very tight time constraints these days because of the standards. So it, adds, it oftentimes it backfires on the teachers because it's, it's an example of research, but it doesn't fit with the, the mosaic that they're trying to build. So I would say if, if you're going to do outreach you need to start with what are the needs of the teachers, what are the needs of their students, and how can I fit my research into those needs? And that may mean that that particular teacher isn't the partner that you need. You may need to work with a different partner. 
or you may need to put, couch your research in a, a broader context that makes it relevant for the teacher. So discussions ahead of time, even you know, before you plan your education and outreach activity, is a good idea. And that's, uh, that's a role where the, sci the scientific societies can really help to build those partnerships. Yeah, I'll um, just agree with everything you said, Dean. Um, I think that that is really a crucial element in the, in the activities that we did. Um, you know, we're working on the details of the Earth's energy budget, but we didn't go to the schools with, you know, here's the fine, you know, 0.1% measurement that we're trying to make. We went to the schools with, you know, looking at clouds. Um, and in some sense, some of my colleagues on the science team were a little bit um, disappointed with that because they really wanted to share the cutting edge. But that's not, like you said, that's not what that audience needs. And so um, several people said, you know, really um, speaking that language and understanding um, what is going on in that, in that audience is really crucial. Um, I'll also just throw in another uh, thought, which is that you really have to get out there into a classroom. And I remember the first time that I went to a classroom, I went to a middle school, which in retrospect was a little bit crazy, but anyway, um, I went to a middle school with a colleague of mine who had done some previous work with kids. And you know, I went in, this is in the area of view graphs, and I brought my view graphs and I was ready to do my little spiel. And he got up and he started walking around the classroom and waving his arms and you know, writing on the board and drawing and stuff. And, and that was my first introduction, but really understood that that culture of, of the classroom is very different than like AGU and that you can't um, use the same uh, modes of communication that you use with your scientific colleagues. Um, and so that's one example of, of how you've got to really link um, the two cultures as well as the topic. I'd like to follow up on that with a specific um, question. When we do outreach to the schools, we encounter difficulties with the understanding of the word model. Mm -hmm. Have you found that as well? So when we talk about uncertainties, um, it's misinterpreted that we don't know what we're doing, um, even though it's a matter of accuracy and precision. Do you have any suggestions, any of you, on how to deal with that? Um, it's sort of the old discussion on theory means something different to a scientist than it does to the general public. And we've sort of gotten our tools together to deal with that question. How do we deal with modeling and how do we convey the scientific importance of models mm -hmm. to students? I can speak a little bit to that and uh, I think that that's a symptom of, um, it represents a, a larger uh, issue, which is that of misconceptions. Yes. So vocabulary is uh, kind of the, the, <coughs> the point of contact for um, understanding what the misconceptions are. And I think that uh, for our project, uh, one way that's been helpful for us to address this is that uh, scientists need to meet with either the classroom teacher or a professional, um, a professional matchmaker, which is what I am. I'm a matchmaker between professional scientists and teachers, uh, to make sure that the, that the uh, scientist understands the culture of the classroom and uh, the most widespread, widespread misconceptions, including those vocabulary terms. Um, right, in, uh, model is one of them. Uncertainty, uh, you know, various statistical terms are very often misinterpreted, but there are, there are very common uh, misconceptions that we know about and that the scientist needs to know about before they reach out. I have a very recent example of um, not understanding how terms are used differently even amongst across sciences. So I have a healthcare background and longitudinal in healthcare means series, time series um, in a research study and I was speaking with an AGU member and who was talking about how they had lost access to some data for a period of time because of lack of funding. And, I, and they were talking about how that was um, not as valuable then because they couldn't do the time series of kind of what was happening over a couple decades. And I said, oh, you were missing longitudinal data. And they said, we didn't study the Earth's longitudes. 
And I thought, this is so interesting <laughs> because this, I mean, longitudinal research in healthcare is always talked about, and those are healthcare re medical researchers. So I thought, this is really fascinating, and I thought if there's that difficulty across the sciences, then even going to the public is more difficult. Um, but the other thing I would add, our experience in the Thriving Earth Exchange is we have a lot of scientists who do want to work with communities on joint problem solving. The difficulty comes in is that often the scientist comes in with what they want the answer to be based on their research data um, or the proposed solution, and they ha we have to teach them how to listen and to be flexible about what really does the community want to have solved um, because the scientist has so much knowledge of my, what might be happening with drought or um, soil uh, contamination, um, but it's not, the, the community may only want to work on one piece of that, not the entire kind of constellation of everything that's a problem. And so sometimes the scientist comes in and wants to do X where the community wants them to help fix Y. And so there's a lot of listening and un common understanding that needs to happen. And then the best example I heard about uncertainty was Marshall Shepard, who was being interviewed by CNN on climate change. And he was asked about, um, by the reporter about uncertainty. And he said, well, you know, every day you get up and you listen to a weather report. And if someone tells you there's an 80% chance of rain, I bet you take an umbrella with you. But it doesn't mean it might rain. It, but that 20% could happen. And so think about it that way, that we're, we're, we're in an era where these things are going to happen um, and we need to protect ourselves to prevent it from us getting rained upon, kind of basic. It sounds very simplistic, but I thought it was a very powerful metaphor. Yeah, I, I actually ha I have another example that you can use, and this is actually courtesy of NASA. You know, if you think about the, you know, the studies of Pluto, Prior to New Horizons' arrival at Pluto, the, there was a very clear consensus that you know, Pluto should be a, a pretty frozen over, pretty geologically dead world with just a little bit of atmospheric activity. And that was based on what we had seen in other places and the technological limitations of what we could see through telescopes first picture from New Horizon comes back and shows a, 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 an active landscape. And right there, at the, the, our understanding had to change. And I use that as an example because it's, it's not an issue where there was a huge economic you know, concern. You know, there's, no one's going to lose their job because New Horizon discovered Pluto is different. And I think this is how science ideally should work issues like climate change, it gets muddled because there's a lot of economic and personal interests involved. And so the science is, is politicized. But the pure science should work like what happened with Pluto and New Horizon. And the uncertainty of that, that telescopic image was clarified when the probe reaches the planet and we can get a better image. And that's, in theory, what research tries to do in incremental steps. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, just I would like to add, uh, following what you said, that we have had a gift workshop which answers perfectly some of the questions posed here. This was about climate change. In climate change, we mixed up uh, uh, top scientists from the IPCC program with people measuring, and uh, we had a clear idea of what uh, uncertainties are and what models are, and especially when we, uh, when they, I didn't talk, uh, they spoke about modeling for the future with uh, uncertainty, why we had so many, what was the limit, you know, some kind of, uh, they depend not only on the models, different from one another, but also from the scenario you business as usual, things like that. So the, the, something which is not uh, predictable by the model, except if you know, if you put something deciding yourself, we, we stay at the present level of the industrial and 
engagement on, on so on. So there are arguments in which you can talk about models, uncertainty, uh, new, new discoveries and so on. And my impression is that the teachers understand very well what a model is if people take the time to explain to them a little bit. Mm -hmm. And they are able to pass it over to the kids. To me, a 10 years old kid understands usually much better than a grown-up science. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, thank you, everyone. Um, we just have to move on because of the time limit. Um, so the second topic is on scalability and reach. So we have all these wonderful um, initiatives and, and directions that we are taking, but we might want to consider the practicality um, how we are going to uh, do it uh, with the maximum impact. Um, just a couple of examples or maybe issues to explore here. Um, Research-based education for all students. Well, in my current role, um, well, I'm, I, I'm a geoscience researcher, but at the same time, I'm looking at policy um, development and implications um, related to linking research and education. Um, one issue that we have institutionally is that uh, we want, really actually want students to be able to participate in doing research in and embed it in the curriculum. So it is not something like if you're lucky, if you're enthusiastic, you do a summer research project, but for most students they just don't do it. And, uh, it, it, well, we have the commitment to do it uh, at University College London, and it is not an easy thing to do, but uh, we, we need a lot of uh, leadership, a lot of uh, resources, a lot of planning, and a lot of evaluation. So this is something that we could explore, perhaps, um, for undergraduates not, in, not majoring in geoscience and how we could involve them into uh, geoscience research, for example. The second topic that uh, I, um, I've identified is sustainability versus innovation. I think a lot of us are, are very keen to develop uh, exciting projects. There are lots of uh, innovations uh, happening, but at the same time, are we not remembering that uh, uh, those projects, some of them should actually carry on and uh, and have the impact that we intend? And how do we select the ones that we continue to develop, continue to invest our time and effort, and which ones to drop? And who makes that decision? And how do we maximize the impact? So um, off to you guys. Good. Who wants to uh, start? throw something out there. Um, I think that in the current uh, situation, one, one really good option for this that, that makes it a little bit easier um, is to leverage citizen science. Um, so there are, at this point, I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of different citizen science projects out there um, on all aspects. You know, whatever you're studying, there's probably a citizen science program out there that somebody has created and they have different levels of engagement. So if you have a student who's not that interested but they just want to do a little bit, they can find a project that will allow that and if they want to get really into it, um, in many cases, you know, projects have different levels of engagement within them. So I think um, looking at citizen science, existing citizen science projects that other people have developed um, is probably a really, like a low hanging fruit in, in making this happen. Um, you know, if you want to get into something more specific, that's harder. But I think that there's, there's so many projects out there now that you can find something for almost anyone. In, in Alaska, we have had um, luck, actually, with education policy and embedding GLOBE into mandated curricula. And so there's, yeah, there's movement toward making it sustainable and um, for all students, not just the motivated ones that are going to go to the GLOBE regional science fairs and, you know. Well, if, if, if I may, you know, one of the things that GSA is discover, has discovered and is evolving its own education programs with this in mind is the model used in universities for training graduate students is designed to create very high quality scientists. It, it does that very well. 
but it's a very resource intensive approach in terms of instructor time, in terms of, of you know, research dollars that are needed. That model doesn't work if you're trying to reach particularly K-12 audiences because the budgets just aren't there and they're not going to be there. So instead of having high quality, intense you know, professional development for a small group of teachers who will then affect a small group of students, we're taking a model that has worked in, that comes out of some of the states where you focus on the local geoscience for the local teachers. That takes, that brings your costs much further down so more teachers can participate. You can focus also on the content that is most relevant to what those teachers and their curriculum need. So instead of having a program for 10 P teachers in Yellowstone, you know, three times a year, we can hope to put on three or four programs at the, in, in three or four states affecting 100 teachers and do that sustainably every year because we're not relying on uh, federal dollars that will, will sunset at some point, but we're relying on what the teachers themselves can bring, the activities of our members, our, our volunteer you know, army of, of excited people, and a little bit of local industry funding. So you're not going to ExxonMobil and asking for $10 million. You're going to a local division and getting 1000 which they can afford and then sustain. Dean, I'd like to chime in on that. Um, you're bringing in something very important, which is the local geography. And sense of place research documents the importance of the local landscape for our learners. Something else to consider, I was in a professional development program um, that included 60 teachers, and we also made it a requirement that the teachers had to go back to the non-participants and do an educational session for them. So that way you can get that grassroots movement going. And if we can align these tasks, these, these new um, research opportunities to the existing state standards, and as pointed out, not everyone has adopted Next Generation, and not everyone will in the United States. But if we can align these programs to the state standards that the teachers have to address, those objectives they have to do, I think we can build sustainable solutions. In, um, in France, we have a program for the secondary school at about 15 uh, years old. Every, every student is uh, required to spend one week in a research lab, whatever the research lab is. They are not allowed to touch instruments because, <laughs> no, because of uh, insurance problems, okay? But they just look, they ask all the questions we wish, and and they have to make a report. So we have, in general, the ones passed through my lab, uh, were very impressed of what we did, and uh, they knew, ah, I know what I will do in my future, and things like that. And one very beautiful report was, now I know what I don't want to be when I'm grown up. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to expect everything. But it is OK. I mean, you know, you are right to decide not to be a scientist, mm -hmm. but you have to know what science is. That's great. So a, a tried and true model for sustainability is train the trainer, and uh, that works quite well, but um, it has to also, uh, again, be flexible uh, because sometimes the trainers uh, will encounter people who are not as enthusiastic as they are about learning uh, about Earth systems. Um, there are a couple factors that work. Um, the Nation Next Generation Science Standards are a terrific uh, framework and template uh, because they incorporate the practices of science. And um, the, I think the salient factor to consider when we're trying to promote universal uh, at least a bit of understa uh, understanding and experience with the practice of science is that most of the teachers haven't had that experience. So I think we're all talking about let's engage the teachers uh, in opportunities where they can, even for a limited amount of time, um, uh, make observations, uh, 
create testable questions, collect data, and then try to make sense of it and communicate about it. Um, and, uh, and getting teachers to the point where they're comfortable not knowing all the answers that, uh, to the questions their students devise. Uh, and also guiding the students, but not just telling them what to do. It's really difficult to step back and do that. Um, the second point is that, uh, again, it's the sustainability of teachers need about three interventions before they feel um, empowered and uh, capable of leading that kind of investigation themselves. It's much um, more comforting to have somebody co-teach it with you. So. Um, it's absolutely, we, research on uh, teacher uh, professional development shows that you really need the, the long-term support and not just the one intervention. Yeah. I, think, I think most everybody has mentioned that. That's great, thank you. So, uh, well, we move on to the third topic, uh, cross-community engagement. It's a massive <laughs> topic. Um, mm -hmm. Different roles, different communities. Um, but just to pick uh, a few, um, interesting themes and I hope that uh, uh, you will be able to develop uh, uh, maybe to tell us uh, your, your experience and share with us uh, your insights. So uh, students taking on new roles, um, we have seen a lot of projects involving students uh, being co-creators of knowledge, they are really partners, there's a movement of uh, students as partners um, across higher education. Um, so I guess students are no longer um, just on the, the passive receiving end of uh, these education um, initiatives. Um, we also I think we might be uh, seeing lot, a, a lot more peer-to-peer -to -peer, to peer engagement. So it's not so much about educators and researchers reaching out to the communities, but the communities themselves are helping each other and they're developing the, uh, their networks. Uh, diversity has always been uh, uh, a consideration and I think we can do uh, quite a bit more. And interdisciplinarity. I think, well, it's been a buzzword for quite some time, and especially researchers, um, I think in any grant proposals, you just can't avoid uh, putting that word in. <laughs> well, sometimes it, it means different things to different people. Um, but perhaps students and the general public uh, are less familiar with the term. But given that we are really solving global issues and, um, and these are not so difficult to understand, maybe we could explore ways to uh, use interdisciplinarity as a concept uh, in our outreach activities, perhaps. I was in a higher education conference last week, so completely different from this one. Um, I was uh, in various sessions um, with social scientists talking about uh, how higher education should be funded and the ecosystem within uh, the, uh, um, the, the communities and between the communities. And one word popped up all the time is Anthropocene. And it's not just, uh, well, I mean, I just suddenly found that I was perhaps in AGU, perhaps. So it was uh, totally unexpected. Uh, but for the social scientists, they are already using some of the, uh, the concepts that, uh, that, uh, that originate from, well, with some geological uh, uh, connotations, but uh, clearly linking to social sciences and Earth system um, and how it uh, interacts with uh, human societies and, and so forth. So um, lots of different um, ideas and concepts, but uh, again, um, any thoughts on these topics or other topics related to cross-community engagement? Who would like to start? <laughs> Just pick on any of the <laughs> well, well, one thing that, if, if you think of this from the perspective of a, a high school student or an undergraduate, they don't necessarily see the disciplines and the little silos that we've built for ourselves. They see the world as a big picture and they want to see how what they're learning fits into that big picture. So one of the things that we try to do with the teachers is not just show them geoscience content, 
but also take them out to industrial sites where they can meet working geologists and working engineers and people who are using geology in some, or geoscience in some form in the wider world. And as they're seeing how these people do their jobs, suddenly they realize, oh, I do need to learn how to write reports and to speak well publicly because that will be part of my job. And yes, math is useful. I, w I will challenge you on that one because I cannot count the number of times if I'm teaching an intro uh, geosciences course and we get to earthquakes and volcanoes and I talk about a logarithmic scale, I can literally hear the oxygen getting sucked out of the room <laughs> as people <gasps> breathe in and say, we need math in here. Like, yes, you do. You need math everywhere. So. I think part of the issue, in the United States at least, has been the compartmentalization of education. Prior to the 1900s, you didn't study chemistry or biology or physics. Um, you didn't study math independently of the sciences. But we do that today. And we also see that for college-bound students, there tends to be a certain progression. Um, it, it differs a little between states, but not a whole lot. Um, oftentimes, geosciences is not offered in public schools. We know that. And when it is, it's typically offered as the rocks for jocks course, that you can't take the chemistry and pass the chemistry. Therefore, let's just put you in earth science or geology. <laughs> Um, and of course, it's, it's really ironic considering that the life sciences and the earth sciences are what everyone needs to live harmoniously on the planet. So I think our school system has an issue with this compartmentalization. Um, and I'm glad to hear that the students you're interacting with recognize that they do need to write outside of, outside of an English class. I'm still getting the emails that are poorly misspelled and, and sent in I am language. Yeah. Does okay. anyone use Anthropocene, by the way? I know that at the International Geological Congress in Cape Town, South Africa, they defined what would be the boundary for Anthropocene, but it has not been officially recognized. Is that correct? So um, do you use it, panelists? The term? The term, yes. Although it's not officially a geological. Yeah. yeah. It's, well, it's the current era, right? Now, we're, now is the current era? No. Well, it, it, the common era? We're, well, Cenozoic era, we're looking at the, the recent or the Holocene epoch, but we haven't yeah. officially recognized Anthropocene. So it's interesting that the sociologists are using this, and we're yeah. not. Well, to to, to answer, the, answer your question about the anthrop and Anthropocene, I personally have not used it much because, and, and this comes ironically because one of the, the part of the research in geoscience says that geoscience of all the sciences has the greatest number of terms needed to have an understanding of the field. We are the, the worst at jargon of all the sciences. And because of that, I, I, I try not to introduce more terms than are needed. So. At, t at some point, I'm sure the Anthropocene will be so commonly understood that it, it, everyone uses it, but I don't add it at the moment because it's just another term that then has to be defined. Yeah, um, I would say uh, similarly, I don't use it because it's not really that relevant to what I'm trying to convey to students. But going back to the discussion that we've been having um, off and on at this session, you know, as Dean just mentioned, the, the vocabulary, the language yeah, really. can be a real barrier. And um, in Virginia, um, I work with a earth scientist and the Virginia earth science, high school earth science curriculum is basically vocabulary. And students have a really hard time passing it because they have to learn some hundred, you know, I don't know how many vocabulary terms. And that's really that's missing the point of geoscience, in my opinion. Um, so, in terms of cross-community engagement, I think, you know, stepping back a little bit from that, that vocabulary and just talking about the concepts and the processes um, would really be helpful for us. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious how you engage with your students. Um, do they um, take an active part in the initiative in shaping what you do? 
Are they partners in your initiatives or they are probably taking on a more conventional role, uh, they're being educated? Any, any comments? I'm, I'm just going to take that. Um, I think that's the reason why we, um, starting from, you know, working with teachers in the classroom from K-12, the emphasis is trying to make it student-centered, mm -hmm. which makes it, you know, which gives the power to the students in saying, uh, you know, giving them a way to influence what they're, they're going to be learning and, and have a voice in that. But it's hard. It's hard because it makes it uh, difficult for the teachers to plan ahead. But, you know, being wide open, um, even though it's, it's more useful, can be, um, you know, uh, difficult for them to handle. Yeah, it's, but that's the, yeah. that's the approach that's, that's being recommended, yeah. uh, um, having it student-centered. Mm. Um, more recently, um, I've been leading on a project. Um, it started with a, quite a radical idea. Well, I'm also based in a learning and teaching center. It's one of those units that uh, engage teachers in, in universities, you know, with the sort of like how you can uh, teach differently, the pedagogy and, and so forth. Um, so I worked with a, a with a team of students actually from uh, many, many departments across the entire university, um, starting with the idea of uh, students teaching teachers how to teach. <laughs> and uh, they wrote us a textbook and they are now <laughs> using it to teach the professors. <laughs> and it works beautifully. It's a really a totally unexpected initiative. Well, I mean, the impact. Um, apparently, professors are better students if they are taught by their students. <laughs> They're inspired by them. And, 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 I, and I think it, is, it may be difficult, but I think students do rise to the challenge. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, with a little bit of publicity, if you want, <laughs> if you want to, uh, uh, well, it will be published in March 2018, uh, but do get in touch with me if you want more details. It will be freely downloadable. The, the, the textbook. That's a perfect segue. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, we move on to the final um, uh, topic. It's on reciprocity in research education synergies. I think um, today we are hearing a lot of uh, research to education type of uh, um, synergy. I'm just wondering if uh, the panelists have any thoughts on teaching enhanced research, so it's the other way around. Um, the term, well, appeared in the literature, uh, yeah, actually I think it has been in existence for about 10 years. It's an academic now based in Australia, Angela Brew, who uh, has been using it. So it is about researchers also benefiting from uh, doing education. It's not just being inspired by the students, but in tangible ways there are benefits in their research programs, um, be it in outreach and, and all the other activities. And those, so that's one of the issues. Maybe it would be great to hear from, 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 from you. The other one is disparity in institutional recognition. Um, it's often true, it's not universally true, but uh, it's often true that uh, research professors or research, ac research focused academics get the promotion. Mm. It's much easier to uh, recognize research excellence in terms of citation, grant funding, and all the rest of it. Um, it's a little bit more difficult to recognize teaching um, excellence. Well, you can win a teaching prize and so forth, but I think education is much more than the teaching. Um, so in my university, there is a movement and uh, with uh, the uh, institutional commitment to, to, uh, to, to come up with criteria yeah. that you can measure, well, not objectively, but some indicators of how you can make uh, impact in education, uh, informal and formal, and how uh, 
that can lead to promotion. So I think it's a motivation issue. Um, any thoughts on these topics, panel? I, I can give a case study, which is in the Made Clear project, we're trying to promote uh, interdisciplinary teaching of climate change, so teaching in, uh, in political science and government, one French class uh, is teaching it, but uh, the science uh, professionals who, who collaborate with the instructors <coughs> in, in English or political science or government uh, don't gain credit or, or any recognition for helping with that very important education. So I just want to um, agree with your point that there need to be criteria for recognizing contributions to education, although it's, it's not as uh, clear, clear or easy as citations. Yeah. Well, this question could be a panel in and of itself. <laughs> And the reality is the economic incentives for universities and for the different classes of faculty are very distorted at the moment. The, the slides that I produced for this panel were actually a, a, a based on an, another talk I gave at an AAUP, American Association of University Professors meeting which was looking at the structure of academia and how do we elevate what is now the majority of the faculty, which are not tenure track, contingent faculty who are basically turning into teaching machines, but locked out of the research system while all the resources are increasingly tied to the faculty who are doing research. And it's, it's, just, it's a big problem and ultimately the health of the research enterprise is, I would say, threatened because of this, of this very issue. And I don't know how you fix it until the, until the funders recognize that you know, indirectly they are part of the problem and that they change the incentives. I, this, uh semester I just was on a writing team for a proposal to the National Institutes of Health and they required on the leadership team of the proposal to be a certified K-12 teacher and so that to me I was like oh man here's a way to break through and off you know instead of being like Elaine is the PI and the teacher is the, the senior personnel they had to be at the top so yeah. some funders are trying to address it I think. So there's a question in the audience. Question yeah. in the audience. Of course. Go Please. ahead. Go, Mar Margie. <laughs> Asking all the questions from the audience today. Um, I'm wondering how many of you are, are facing online classes and how you think that's going to change really the complexion of everything. I see it as being very remote. I mean, it offers opportunity to, you know, a different group of student, but that connection, the ability to really move them forward in really meaningful ways, I think is lost. And I'm just curious, because it sort different. of fits in this one session. I, I can take that one. It's different. So I was hired by Mississippi State University to work with their online program, which started in, um, at least the teachers in geosciences started in 1998. And I'm, I'm tenure track. I'm tenured. Um, when I first encountered an online classroom, it was very, very different than the large classes that I taught previously. Um, we had our intro classes in an auditorium with 250 students. You can do research in online environments. So I teach a history of life course, and my students go out to their local environments. They have to document uh, collecting fossils. Um, of course, they're given guidelines on how to do that, and no, no trespassing allowed. Um, they're also allowed to go to museums and document local fossils that were collected in their, uh, in their state or sometimes adjacent states. It's possible. It's different. I've also seen online classes done very, very well and very, very poorly. So there's a continuum, just as we all can acknowledge that we probably had a professor who was not probably the best <laughs> educator, um, and we've had someone who was only um, hired as an educator who probably should have been in a lab. 
Um, we've had great experiences and we've had poor experiences, and we see the same with online. I think at this point I've finished three online students' theses. So I've had three online students finish a thesis project and then come to the university to defend that, um, and they were very, very well done. Um, I don't think that's an exception. I, you know, I think that Mississippi State does run great online classes, but I hear of other people doing it too. So the short answer to that is it is changing. Um, we see that students enroll in online classes because they may be working full time. Um, they cannot get to a university. The local university may be two and a half hours away, or the local university may only offer classes in eight to five settings, and they unfortunately can't take that. Um, so online classes are filling that need for um, a good many students who are high quality students, but it is different. It's very, very different, and you have to cultivate um, that online rapport between the instructor and the students. Uh, my students have mandatory discussion boards, and we, <laughs> um, it, it's only 10% of their grade, but it is, it is graded because otherwise they wouldn't do it, right? Um, and we've had uh, semester-long climate discussions. We've had uh, six-week climate discussions. Um, I have people coming up to me at conferences saying, oh, Dr. Clary, I recognize you from the video. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then they tell me their names, and it's like, oh, two years ago, yes, you were in, um, you were in Geology of North America. Uh, you sent me your sand sample from you know, California, and I sent you back the micro photographs. It's different, but you can do it. You can do it effectively. Thank you. So I'm aware of the time. Uh, we started off with these two overarching questions. Uh, we explored lots of different ideas along the way. Um, I would just like uh, to invite the, the, the panel to have the final word um, on, the, um, on, on these two questions, maybe just to give us a takeaway message on how academics, institutions, students, external stakeholders can work together. So uh, building on that last topic, I would like to just offer an optimistic view, um, which is that you know, with the internet and all of the related tools that we have available to us now, I think there's, there's huge potential um, for some things that we couldn't have done before. Um, so uh, for example, I saw several posters earlier this week where there are groups that are working together to come up with uh, geoscience demonstrations or labs or activities. And so it's not the individual professor having to invent the wheel every time um, and you know only having a limited amount of time to do it. You can really put the best minds together and you can create the best activities possible. Um, and it's, so I think that, that there's some real potential um, that could be uh, realized as we go forward if we can collaborate and work together and link yes, across uh, various yeah. fields. Thanks very much, Lee. Dean. So I would say the key to success is, is, is really a take on the word of diversity. There is no one exact formula that you should follow. It's about relationships. You're going to need to reach out and be willing to be reached out to by parties that you may never have anticipated being collaborators and you may find yourself doing things you never imagined. It can be daunting but also very exciting because the, you know, it, 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 is, it is truly the case where the, the whole ends up being the sum of the parts once you get it going. Thanks, Dean. And I guess I would like to just um, encourage continued support of early career um, scientists that are delving into the um, sharing science realm and um, trying to be the do both fields uh, honestly and with rigor um, and immersed in the the practice and the, the theory um, because I, I think that we will be be the trusted messengers between the the two fields I want to give one last example of um, the uh, not the usual suspects and uh, 
in service of the idea that um, what our priorities are may not necessarily be the, pri the same as the priorities of our, the people that we're collaborating with. Uh, and the example is that um, in Baltimore City, there's a workforce development program where um, people who are, they may be coming out of prison or they may be changing jobs, maybe their, their job, um, maybe they were fired or their job uh, st stopped existing. Uh, but so they're in a landscaping uh, training program and their goal is they, they want a job and so they're learning these landscaping skills. But we've been working, May clear has been working with them because um, climate change has an impact on landscaping and they need to know that and they will be working in the neighborhoods of Baltimore. Uh, and if they know that knowledge, they can then communicate it to uh, both their, the people who employ them, but also the, the citizens in the communities. So they're learning about climate change uh, and how it impacts their profession of landscaping uh, because that's what's important to them. So I think that meeting the, meeting the constituents and the audiences where they are, we can both get something of what we want. Uh, last but not least, Carlo, would you like to say um, for us, <laughs> as a researcher as well? So, uh, well, I would just leave you with this quote. I think um, that's really sums, that really sums up uh, the leadership that we need um, to take things forward. We all have different roles, different perspectives, but we can all lead, and we lead together and probably we'll find a solution, a better solution. So thank you very much to everyone thank on the you. panel. Oh, there's a question. Oh, there was a question. Oh. Oh, would you like to, uh, it's okay, sure. Uh, would you like to ask a question? Bonnie. Bonnie. I do, actually. <laughs> this is fine. Okay, yeah. Um, first of all, I want to thank um, especially Lynn and Renee for bringing up the potential of online education. It certainly is not, um, easy and maybe not even optimal, um, but it is a viable way that we can make work. I am a graduate of the MSU program and um, it, it was interesting to work through that and tackle the challenge of how can I learn about geoscience without going into a classroom, but you can have students go out in the field and you know have that part of it. So um, that's an, I do think that that's an important issue to raise. And I would say that with the first year I went out into the field with my online students, they had been participating in a master's program for two years. And I'm a scientist, I was skeptical. Could they really learn in those online classes? Um, they had open book tests, they had to do projects, but were they really doing it or were they getting outside help? And I have to say, I was blown away. I was so impressed by the expertise, the knowledge of my students who had worked for two years in these online classes. Mm -hmm. um, they performed just as well, in some cases better, um, than some of my on-campus students. So yes, they can learn in an mm -hmm. online environment. It is different, but it is becoming bigger and bigger each and every day, um, and we have to accommodate. We mm -hmm. can't say that we're not going to do this. We have to do this, but we have to make it relevant and send them into their local environments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And then one other thought I wanted to share was um, I felt it percolating through a lot of the conversations um, when the issue of how do we deal with what is a model and what are observations and vocabulary and all of that. And um, one really helpful strategy is to bring the teachers and the students back to that nature of science. You know, too many teachers teach that it's the first chapter in the textbook, it's the first item on the pacing guide, and they teach it in September or August whenever school starts, and it's <laughs> never brought up again. It is, you know, behind everything, but making it out there and starting that discussion with a scientist of this scientist does science, and so what is the process they do that by, and what is the nature of science? And I think that would be helpful to have students see it as a process. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, that is one of my um, unhappy moments with the next generation science standards. Um, the nature of science is included in the framework. It's not really included. It is supposed to be embedded, but it's not explicitly embedded in next gen. And the history of science has disappeared. 
and I do a lot of research in the history and philosophy of science and science teaching, and it, it, it works very well. Students are engaged, they enjoy it, they love learning about past scientists, sometimes who behave quite badly in controversies, but it gives them that scientific habit of mind, and that is a wonderful point. We need to keep hammering home the nature of science. Thank you. Thank you all.